Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning from here, anyway, here in the uh, north of the Arctic Circle, quite a bit north of the Arctic Circle. It's about 5.15 in the morning. And uh, here we are relatively in different apparent places. This is our, um, our continuing uh, Seeds of the Infinite webinar. And all these organizations, I look at them as the sponsors. Actually, I like how pretty they look, you know, all the different colors. <laughs> but uh, I suppose in the background of it all, uh, it's our own quest for true identity, which is uh, sponsoring our interest and these particular programs. Um, you know, there's always. Um, I thought to myself, what shall I, what shall I say? There are many things to say, and then really, there's nothing to say at all. Um, there is a sense in which this kind of study is a little bit spiritually dangerous because it can make one um, lose track of all of the uh, factors which are immediately present. Now, you know, here we are <clears throat> entering Virgo. We're not far off. Uh, this is August 29th, at least here in this location in, in the United States. And uh, it's going to be for some August 28th. And we're coming close to the Virgo full moon which is at uh, 6.35 and 9 seconds uh, p.m. Universal Time, uh, Greenwich Mean Time, today. And we'll have our um, usual uh, presentation. Uh, the two of you will lead a, me uh, a service meditation with music and image, and uh, we'll do our best to broadcast from here. But the theme is Virgo. And it's the service of the immediately present. That's one of the interesting lines that D.K. tells us about uh, Virgo. And I might call it, you know, I'll, I'll always be using different languages here, you know, or at least uh, evolving a certain language. The service of that which is immediately presented. Now, to our senses and to our other limited human faculties, uh, various uh, images and impressions, vibrations, perceptions are presented to our consciousness. And even though <clears throat> ultimately they aren't really real, with all capital letters, they are the immediately present, they are the immediately presented factors of life. So uh, we have to deal with multiplicity in a very practical way when attempting to solve this problem of the one and the many. And I guess it's a problem ever to be solved in every universe. So in quest of the one, which we ever are, or at least we are the unbounded one, this, you know, I don't like to call us the one because that kind of um, unitizes it and makes it into a bounded something. We are that too, but you know, in, in quest of this unbounded one, the bounded, the boundless, <clears throat> the mutable principle, we can lose sight of all the factors in the great Mahamaya, which is the universe. You know, it's uh, the universe considered as a necessary illusion forever recurrent. And uh, our task, even though we are um, a ray of the absolute, our task is somehow to work out mm, our own intention, our own purpose, our own plan within this tremendous Mahamaya of the universe. And we've been doing that forever. This is the amazing thing. See, in a way, what we need 
is to completely readjust our time scale. We have to readjust what we think we are so that we no longer think of ourselves uh, in any ultimate way as the ways we have been thinking of ourselves, you know, as relatively, as relative beings, temporary beings, um, beings for whom uh, t time, um, uh, being and time do not agree, time and form do agree. So we're so used to thinking in terms of form that we have to stop doing that. I, mean, I don't mean that we stop doing that in our daily life. We obviously have to deal with all the forms and to, um, as I like to say, to archetypalize the moment, meaning to find that archetype at the beginning which has filtered down uh, into our relative being and which represents all beauty and all goodness uh, and all purpose as far as we can perceive it and enact it. But, you know, we, we need a kind of a dual consciousness here in the world, yet not of the world, in a very ultimate sense. And we have to be able to sustain both of these simultaneously. Well, if we were the Buddha, which, of course, essentially we are, <laughs> but uh, if we were the Buddha, we could do that. He was a six-degree initiate. He, he had uh, full uh, monadic consciousness and a touch of the cosmic mental plane, as we're told, and, and he could live in this state of beingness, of identification, and still handle in the most practical manners uh, the uh, presentations of the moment, the that which was immediately given, the immediately present, the immediately presented. So it, it, it's really... Um, a demand for a dual life on a very high level. We sometimes say, well, uh, I'm in the world, not of it. Okay, that means I am the soul and not the personality. Well, that's somewhat true. You know, we have to live as both soul and personality uh, simultaneously. And eventually we have to live as monad or pure being uh, and along with it, soul-infused personality. We, we, we cannot escape duality. That is the amazing thing. Uh, the, the whole presentation of the universe in a cyclic manner according to uh, the secret doctrine is uh, coming out of the second fundamental, the law of periodicity. There's going to be an on-off, on-off, on-off for, forever. There's going to be universe, no universe, universe, no universe, forever, and there always has been. So that that's the sense in which um, uh, the Mahamaya is inescapable. You know, uh, the great sage Shankara, who is maybe the balancing point of the Buddha, uh, he said, most mysterious is Maya and forever. Well, at least I would like to add to that cyclically forever, because we do, we do return uh, to a state in which the universe is not on. But for a long time, <laughs> Uh, long time. Uh, the, the universe is very definitely with us, and uh, we have trillions upon trillions, quadrillions, sextillions, nonillions, what, whatever termini, terminology for, for large numbers we want to use uh, to, to go in, in this universe. We don't even know uh, to what extent uh, we are penetrated into it. And then there's the universe as it exists, not just in object Activity, but that whole inner universe. So we're going to be in the universe uh, a long time, forever, as we always have been. But uh, at the same time, I can't help but use the, the language of relativity, we have to have the sense of that which just doesn't change at all. And, uh, you know, we can, we can call that thing God. Uh, well, it's really not a thing at all. It's a no thing. You know, we can call it by any name we want, but it's not the real thing at all. Whatever name we, we use uh, will not really capture the nature of this, you know, n nameless something or this nameless nothing.
But anyway, we, you know, living our practical lives, helping each other along the path, uh, expanding our relative uh, existence in this world of the Mahamaya, we continue, but, but more and more aware of that fundamental something which never has changed and never will and is the absolutely immutable and that's the great contradiction of course because how can uh, change and changelessness exist simultaneously and maybe the mind cannot fully capture that um, but experience can capture that and uh, that's the experience we're looking for as joseph campbell said not the meaning of life but the experience of being alive the experience of, of identifying as that great life as my wife so often says the great life you know identifying as that great life which is the origin and source of all that we call time and space and form so you know that's a little bit of the philosophy behind what we are doing now what I'm saying basically is that what we're doing here is experiential as well as cognitive. And the experience we're looking for, well, <laughs> that's that's the experience of the very high initiations, and that's just the very beginning of it all. So we're just getting a little reflected light, a little glimmer here. As I said to one of my friends, I can't imagine that the perception of being or the perception of being as being is the same for an illumined human being as it is for uh, an illumined planetary logos or an, an illumined solar logos and on and on and on and ultimately the experience of being for the uh, illuminated uh, universal logos the one and only being of cosmos I can't imagine that that's exactly the same in intensity as that experience that a human being might have but still we're on our way forever and we're uh, coming back uh, to what we essentially are without having ever left it and you know we're going to be, get involved in all kinds of paradoxes here the paradoxes in certain terms of our normal thought process and our normal language but so be it we have to learn to live with paradox and even though it jars the mind and it may say well, wait that's not logical that's not consistent we have to get used to the idea that that in a way the ultimate reality might be called the great contradiction I have a lot of names for this thing that we're not supposed to name I, I said in my book infinitization of selfhood I had about 241 names for the nameless you know I just went beyond beyond but uh, Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about some names for the nameless, just a few, and try to get the idea of it. Well, okay, as usual, I, I give a little bit of a preamble, right? But, but there's also going to be a meditation, and that's coming right up, so let's get into that. And this is, uh, we'll begin in a way similar to how we began before, but we'll get into some other things and other perceptions. The the whole idea behind all these meditations is to um, radically alter the way you and I think about ourselves. I mean, you know, we take things for granted, you know, and we just say, oh, myself, yeah, that's myself, okay. But this radical alteration, alteration of how we think about ourselves is, is the goal. And, and when we have radically altered our usual self-conception and self-perception, we will have entered somewhat the state of identification, which is uniquely the ability of the masters of the wisdom on this particular planet. I mean, here we are on this planet just torn between the polar opposites and... Uh, we put them back together by finding that which is neither of them through the state of identification and we become true uh, lesser dragons of wisdom not a planetary logos in the sense of a dragon of wisdom but we become a dragon of wisdom a lesser dragon of wisdom and we're all on our way and it won't be so very long during the Aquarian age uh, a lot of masters have to be 
made, so to speak. A lot of initiates of the fifth degree have to emerge if the time-space schedule of the planetary logos is going to emerge. So that means, you know, whether it's going to be in the age of Aquarius or the subsequent age of Capricorn, so many of us, maybe all of us, will know what it's like to really live in isolated unity, which is the prerogative of the consciousness of the Master, and of which we are just getting a little glimmer at this time. Okay, on and on, I'll try to stop, and now we'll go into our meditation. And I want to welcome all of you who are here. We have a nice number of people who have braved this strange subject. And, uh, you know, it can do things to your mind. <laughs> it can destroy the mind uh, in the usual sense of its functioning and uh, reveal something else beyond the mind while still utilizing the mind which has been destroyed in terms of thinking it's real. All right. <laughs> All right. So, we use the old Raja Yoga technique, which is so much found in Brahmanism, in ancient India. And we begin by realizing we are something. We are somewhat something immersed in various types of habitual perception. We are that unit of being, and we have, with that unit of being, we have consciousness. And that consciousness is aware of various vibratory dimensions, with which it tends to identify. We often think we are the body, or we are our vital states, or we are how we feel, or we are what we think, and all that. But while it's ultimately true, it's not practically true on the path of spirituality. Not this, not that. I have a body, but I am not that body. I have these vital etheric states, these energy states, I feel vitalized or tired or energized or not, but I'm not that, not that, neti neti, not that. I have all of my feelings and emotions, my attractions and my repulsions, my desires and, and desires for, desires against. happiness, sadness, ups, downs, but I am not that. And I have my many, many thoughts, but they too will disappear. Where are all of your thoughts about your previous incarnation, incarnations, thousands, millions? Where are they? <coughs> they're not here, they're gone. And yet you are. Not that either. Anything I can really perceive in any objective sense, even subtle objectivity. I'm not that. If I were to enter my egoic body, which is a high, highly desirable thing to do, 
and feel the unity with all of us on the plane of soul, yes, it's a higher condition, but it's still a condition. Very useful, a very useful vehicle. We need to enter this world of light, of love, of spiritual sacrificial will and power and relate to each other as if we're all aspects of one being. Yes, we do that. But even that egoic flotus, well, that disappears too. And I'm not that neti neti. But it's pretty far along the way and we have to learn how to take ourselves into the center, at least imaginatively, into the center, into the central fire, as D.K. calls it, into the central fire of the jewel in the lotus. That's the place where we, as pure being, we as the monad, we have descended. We are the monad in extension, immersed in ever densifying levels of prakriti, of objectivity. And here we are together in the central fire, understanding somehow the unity which connects all of us this harmonious condition of realizing that we are all a part of each other. If I like you, if I don't like you, it doesn't make any difference. We're all a part of each other, of this one larger unified factor. Let's dwell with that for a moment. If you did not exist, I could not exist. You can never rob a being of being. In this great unity, we are all necessary to each other. Of course, ultimately there is no each other, but we have to begin somewhere. The monad is, interestingly, a kind of heart center. We usually think that the soul is the heart center of the monad. That's true, but if you study the tables of the ethers, you will see that for the human being, the normal heart center is located on the second ether. But it's a vibratory location. Well, the monad is located on the second cosmic ether. It's a heart center of something. Probably it finds its place within the planetary logoic heart. So we never can escape the heart. We Bailey people, we do a lot of work in the head, okay, but 
in a deeper sense, the solar logos is a great heart center. And we're all in that magnificent unifying heart as monads. Our, our home, we find our home as monads within the sun, we're told. Interesting. So we try to realize that this unity, all being part of the same thing, all being part of each other, It is a real thing. I just use the word thing, but not in any technical way. It's a real something. And we try to isolate it, isolate the unity, meaning it achieves continuity in our consciousness. We notice it, we realize it, we sustain it, and no matter what happens, 10 million things will happen, no matter what happens, the isolated unity is not disrupted. So a great deal of spiritual finesse is required to sustain practicality and interactivity in the world of Mahamaya and still sustain the unity which has been isolated. And beyond the unity is something else. Not only are we parts of each other, but, well, let's take it further. We are each other. Identical. Identicality. Tiom, Tiom, this too is of me, whatever the this is, Tiom, this too, and this, and this, and this, and this, whatever. cannot name a thing in the world of Nama Rupa, name and form, but that it is of you, the real you, the real me, the real it. This too is of me. T-T-I-O-M. So the unity is not something other than what we are, like I have isolated the unity. No. No. That which I have isolated or noticed in distinction from all other things is my very self, the real self. But it takes a lot to make that the habitual state of perception but it's a pervading something it's found everywhere it's not that image in the mirror it's not any of the vital currents of course it includes them all it's not the feeling of for or against or plus or minus or desire or no desire. It's 
not a huge number of thoughts. No. Something far more subtle. And we need to make the transference from thinking of ourselves as we usually think of ourselves to thinking of ourselves in entirely different terms, something far more real. Inescapably present, always. Every one of us and everything, we are everywhere says the Tibetan, it's the very first requirement for the one who would practice harmlessness. Amazing. That such a deep metaphysical thought experience would be required to practice harmlessness. So our little meditations here, you know, they are for the purpose of a radical change of identity. Radical, which means going to the root. So in that unity, unity we begin to feel some higher octave of normal feeling begin to feel it as yourself as myself as the self just even spend a day trying to do that it'll just turn our minds upside down We reach out to each other in the identicality and somehow, if we take this into the metaphysical realm, we will realize that this unified self is really an emanation of the being, of the one being of cosmos the universal logos. Only one being in cosmos, as cosmos. We could call it the ultimate inflation of identity or the recognition of the ultimate reality in universe. So we come to the radical, heretical statement that I, that figure eight, remember, am essentially the God of this universe. As radical as that may be and seem, and as much as we will be proving that for the duration of this particular cosmos preceded by an infinitude of cosmoses, we have to realize something quite astonishing, ultimately, 
that the God of this universe is an absolute infinitesimal, the smallest possible thing, without being nothing. And we'll get into that over time. And thus Ramakrishna, identifying as God, could say with a twinkle in his eye, I am less, I am less than the dust, the speck of dust on your foot. Yes, what is the source? What is the source? You say, well, it's the soul, it's the monad, it's the planetary logos, it's the... and on and on we go, and all of those are just relative sources of what we are. What is the source of the being, of the universe, of the logos, which we are forever, cyclically? The source. So ponder on the source. because it will take us closer, begin to reveal what we really are beyond any possible distinction or qualification or difference. Yes, as relative beings, we must live, we must love, we must learn. Yes, no time out from universe right now. Do the relative thing. Within the ring pass knot, we have temporarily created for ourselves. But behind it all, as it all, the substance of it all, the source. So we will proceed with such ideas as they may lead to feelings, perceptions, identifications which are beyond the ordinary and which may free us again. We've always been free. Free us again from the great illusion which we perpetually manifest out of our non-illusory nature. And so with these ideas in mind about the source of, of the universe, source of light, love, and power, let us 
sound, the great invocation with which we are so familiar, but ever a great mantra of light and power which admits of ever deepening understanding. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve from the center which we call the race of men. Let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Friends, I can promise you one thing, that if you persist in this way of thought and experience, you will lose everything. And thus, re-become in consciousness exactly what you are, and thus regain everything. And more than everything. Okay, our meditation, and uh, I've got two more parts to this work we're going to do, and um, but first, if anybody has a thought that you would like to offer, we have a little, a little time to do that. You could say, of course, all this is beyond thought in a way it is, of course, but uh, thought is the instrument that brings us to the threshold. You know, just the way Moses could never enter the promised land, so to speak, thought can never enter the promised land of realization as being. You have to kind of leave it at the threshold. It's like, uh, it's a bit like, you know, the five lower subplanes are not yet the esoteric subplanes. You have to leave those planes from the atmic plane on down at the threshold of being. But it does take you there we're being led, you know, we're the horse being led to the waters of life. And we, <laughs> all of our faculties lead us to the point of drinking in the waters of life. But uh, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink, okay. That's up to us, the spirit within, the spirit within. So are there any 
thoughts or comments anyone would like to offer I'll I can look for your hands if you would like and then if you're on staff and you want to just say something just sort of clear your throat and speak because <laughs> I can't see your hand of course okay now there seems to be a question here if I can get at that uh huh just corroboration. Thank you for the intense meditation. Just a corroboration of what you so ably communicated to us in the webinar and Cosmic Fire uh, from 5.11 to 5 to 13. Yeah, thank you for including that. The center in the cosmic body of the one about whom not may be said, of which our solar logos is the embodied force, is the heart center. Therefore, it will be apparent to the careful student, let us all be so, that the entire force and energy of the system and its life quality will be that which we call love. This force, when rightly directed and properly controlled, is the great transmuting agency, which eventually will make of the human unit a master of the wisdom, a lord of love, a dragon of wisdom in lesser degree, yes, solar angels, source is in the heart center. They're called, yes, the hearts of the fiery love of the one about whom not may be said. Yes. Well, you know, that's, um, yes, thank you uh, very much. I think that's from Isabel uh, Kuhn here, and uh, thank you. And, um, okay. Thank you for that thought. You know, there's a big mystery there <laughs> about the one about whom not maybe said what I did want to say about that. Of course, I shouldn't say anything, but that's that's one of those terms which is a transferable term. It in, it involves our relationship to many beings. Now, the very first one about whom not maybe said is at least in my view is our local cosmic logos uh, in which uh, Sirius, uh, the logos of Sirius participates and the, the logos of Procyon and Altair and uh, Alpha and Beta Centauri and so forth. There's some local solar logoi, the seven solar systems of which ours is one. And, you know, it's really a one about whom not may be said. Um, but we can go on to, on, you know, and I think I I may have done this before, but, you know, I have certain favorite pages. I'm sure we all do. Uh, and uh, here on page 293 of Cosmic Fire is this amazing uh, little tabulation. And you see how it goes. Uh, you know, uh, a heavenly man is a chakra and a solar logos, but a chakra, a solar logos is a chakra in... Um, a cosmic logos, such as the seven solar systems, the Lord of the seven solar systems, of which ours is one, and then it goes on to something called the unknown, in which seven constellations are chakras, and that is a higher type of one about whom not may be said. But if I can be so bold and uh, foolish, okay, at the same time, I will uh, go over here to... Uh, uh, cosmic uh, to the one of these maps and uh, just as long as I don't lose the whole thing in the process um, and this is our maps from Fellowship of Cosmic Fire one of our earlier efforts and if we go to page 344 of Cosmic Fire, it's a fantastic map, you know, and uh, there it is, you know. Well, uh, how many ones about whom not may be said are on this map? And uh, my present view, you know, always uh, leaving open the possibility that uh, I can be incorrect and most certainly am about many things, but this little green triangle, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, the unknown. It's the one about whom not may be said that we usually refer to as the one about whom not may be said. But notice, they are chakras too, and they are located in uh, what I call 
sub-cosmic parabrahms, these seven great beings. They are also ones about whom not may be said, and, and then they are chakras too in a a cosmic parabrahman, as, uh, as Master D.K. writes here, and you can only be sure that they too are chakras, <laughs> and on and on and on. And they're all ones about whom not may be said. But, so we have to deal with our local <laughs> one about whom not may be said, who is hardly even on this map, and that is the seven solar systems of which our system one. I know some folks might disagree with me on that, but uh, our local seven solar systems, page 51, you know, of uh, esoteric astrology, it's a being. And in that being, we are a heart center. But we are hardly a heart center in that super being for whom constellations are our chakras. Then the whole constellation would have to be a heart center, not just a little solar logos. Okay, it's all relative, right? So, But nevertheless, God is love and... Uh, the subject is much blinded by the Tibetan, and uh, we have a ladder here, but sometimes we seem to skip a rung on the ladder, and but it's there nonetheless, it's just that we don't perceive it. So my present way of looking at this is we are all part of a great heart center in the logos of the seven solar systems of which ours is one. And then that constellation is in my view, kind of a solar plexus center in the normal one about whom not may be said with other constellations and on and on and on as this particular expansive, wonderful map seems to uh, indicate here. You know, and it's all been colored in. I remember long ago uh, my friend Keith Bailey was coloring in these maps to help us uh, um, get a better orientation about where we really stood in the whole thing. So that's a little expansion then upon the thought there, uh, Isabel. And uh, any other thoughts or questions that you might like to, statements you might like to get into here at this point? Anybody? Before I go on and discuss some names for the nameless. <laughs> names for the nameless. Well, you know, the mind has to take us to the point where we realize there is a nameless something. And um, you see, maybe Brett or Joe or Kay, you know, every time I press the question mark, I get to see it one time. And then when I go back and try to press the question mark again, it doesn't appear. So I don't know what to do about that. I'll just ask you, are there any other questions or statements there in the that I would have to deal with hmm. there's nothing else Michael uh, do you remember that nothing else right there remember that wonderful f photography book called the family of man it must have come out 50 or 60 years ago and uh, there was once this picture of this Buddhist monk and he was deep in thought and underneath it said you know to the wise person there is no great or small. Michael? And of course, yes. There's yes, couple, can you hear me? There's a couple more. Ruby Johnson says, profound thank you. Okay, thanks, Ruby. And Isabel says, You're used thank to it. you for the chart, the colors help. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. They do, they do help to orient us uh, to the septinate, you know, the, the sevenfoldness of uh, all structures in our local cosmosphere and we presume throughout the universe we don't know whether other universes would have other numerical systems you know for us these are so inherent the the one the two the three the seven the twelve the forty nine and you know, all that it's inherent within how we think about reality but uh, as mathematicians have shown you can base mathematical systems upon other fundamentals, other numerical fundamentals. But, you know, we have enough to handle right here and now, <laughs> right here and now in our own 
universe on our own planet right within our own energy system we have a enough to handle just learning how to control our astral body learning how to control our mind learning how to be a soul infused personality we have enough to handle without necessarily worrying about the the numerical structures of other universes but uh, uh, at least in the secret doctrine there are forever other universes and ours is just another I like to call this and all universes the infinitive in a series the infinitive universe but of course that can't be quite correct because every universe is the infinitive it's the last but it is succeeded by an infinitude more of universes so you cannot name our universe as utterly the infinitive even though it's infinitely preceded uh, and yet and yet is it really so those are thoughts we will get into as we stretch the mind almost to the point where it becomes useless and we begin to enter into reality which is I think you know our goal here okay so if there are no other immediate thoughts right here I'd, what, I'll, what I'll get into a little bit I always try to collect something out of my book in process I call it a book in process um, and it's a book of seed thoughts you know and it'll come out sometime let's see this is uh, this one is all of those I I I things we did last time you know the five or six different levels of I all the way from the blank uh, to now uh, to the the elemental I right down here it's all symbolism really and let's see um, some terminology Soti webinar for some terminology yes okay so what I'm going to do is just propose and it, you know these names but we'll kind of ponder on them as we look at these names for the nameless it's just the habit of mind of a human being to attach something finite to that which is infinite you can't help it <laughs> when you <coughs> excuse me <coughs> excuse me when you think of a thing you've immediately finitized it you've unitized it you've taken something which is a no thing and you've thinged it you know I have a little aphorism you know some people would like to say about occultism thou shalt not think okay you know how it is what is meditation not what you think they say okay well not entirely true but uh, I, I, I say thou shalt not thing thou shalt not thing when um, when dealing with the ultimate reality but we can't help it you know and in attempting to say what it is we get a deeper and deeper idea that it's so elusive that it will always escape our thinking and our thinking you know it will always escape our finitizing and our unitizing it 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 will be nameless forever because to name a thing you know how that five-pointed star works satchit ananda satchit ananda uh, you know uh, being sat ananda consciousness or bliss and uh, chit the mind but down at the bottom of that fine-pointed star those two legs that are pointing downward that's nama rupa that's name and form and the one thing we know about or at least our highest thinking leads us there the one thing we know about this no thing is this not name and form it has no name and it has no form and the minute consciousness arises of course it may have a form and I'll try to talk about at some point i will try to introduce just a little little bit of the book every time 
and and what we're going to learn is that I'll say a radical thing here now, okay? That consciousness is an infinite limitation upon beingness. I'm going to repeat that. I'm trying to assimilate it myself, and you know, it's not how we're used to thinking. Consciousness is an infinite limitation upon beingness. So with that in mind, <laughs> let's take a look at some of the names for the nameless here. Of course, one we're really familiar with is the absolute, or you know, we can call it uh, the absoluteness. It just, um, nothing can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided, um, nothing can be altered it's unchangeably the same and of course the unchangeable is uh, the immutable those are other names uh, if we want to talk more in terms of identity we can call this source i'll have to go back to my own book here where i wrote all those names for the nameless and maybe you'd be interested you can find them on the makara website um, which is a, a really great website book put together by Victoria Stone over the uh, years, and uh, there's a lot there that you can find. And uh, that'll be in the book Infinitization of Selfhood, so these names for the nameless, at least it will do something to your mind. The Absolute Deity, um, there's some systems of thought which try to get rid of the idea of deity, but we're not talking about gods, we're talking about the absolute deity, the absolute identity, and it has no uh, specific limited qualities, it just has them all, any possible quality, any, any possible quantity, any possible quality, and that, of course that's absolutely infinite. Uh, it has all these things, and yet strangely it is homogeneous, and that's how can it be homogeneous and have infinitudinous, absolutely infinitudinous qualities? Okay, that's our contradiction, the great contradiction. It's called the great contradiction, at least in my mind. Then we can call it absolute infinitude, and not just any old infinitude, because there are a lot of infinitudes. You know, if I, if I decide to start counting from one until forever, um, there are... Uh, or is, are, I never know quite how to say it. There, There is an infinitude of numbers, but that's just a special case infinitude. You know, there's the combination, there's uh, infinite even numbers, and infinite numbers every skip three, and go, you know, three, six, nine, twelve, and that goes on to infinity and so forth. Um, but infinity is not a destination so much as it is a process. So we call this thing the absolute infinitude. Uh, I think I quoted Spinoza, the great philosopher, that uh, D.K., he said he was a member of the hierarchy, really, in a sense. And he was called the God-inspired philosopher. Of course, his religion kicked him out of the fold, you know, when he started to express his ideas, because they're very, very threatening. These ideas are very, very threatening to the concrete mind, which likes to have things narrow, set, one-pointed, not inclusive, as D.K. describes in four words, the uh, condition of the concrete mind, or four descriptors. Anyway, absolute infinitude, or the absolutely infinite. And just, you could combine infinities of infinities of infinities of infinities, and you could raise any number to the infinite to, to the infinite, to the infinite, and on and on and on. It's absolutely beyond all thought, all reasoning, all apprehension, all grasp. You can just call it, you know, the absolutely infinite. Well, you know, it's, it's not just God out there, it's what we have to realize about ourselves while pre preserving a sense of proportion is that we are the absolutely infinite. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's crazy, but uh, we are that, and um, forever are that, and uh, cannot help but be that. 
and that just means that there's more, shall we say, using relative language in us that can ever be grasped, ever be bound. You can't bind what we are. We're the unbounded one, and that's another name uh, that I have there for the for what we are and what for what the utter reality is. Um, uh, Madame Lavasky calls it be-ness. I think she tries to exist uh, to 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 separate it from existence because the word ex means out of, and there's no out in the it, if I can say that. Every time you've got something called X, it means it's come out of something, and a duality has been created. Well, no real duality has been created. It's just an appearance. It's a part of the Mahamaya, the great uh, illusion. So it's be-ness rather than being, although if we understand being in the right way, we can understand this uh, nameless no-thing as a pure being the absolutely irreducible irreducible it, it, there's just no way to take it apart and to make it anything other than it is just even the it you know I'm, a lot of other words about what this no thing is are coming to me I haven't written them all down you know but maybe in, in, in the book I have written more down now you know in the in the um, The Secret of Doctrine, she, she has the, the four fundamentals of the Secret of Doctrine telling us there will be actually, um, well, three. She gives us three in telling us a new one is emerging. But the very first fundamental, there is a boundless immutable principle. And it's beyond any possibility of thought, so we might as well give up right here, right? <laughs> boundless immutable principle. It's boundless. It's unbounded meaning there's nothing else to bound it. You know, I mean, you have to have something else in order to create a boundary. But there is nothing else. So it's absolutely unbounded, and yet it does not have what we might call extension in space, because space arises with consciousness. And that's something we can think about. You know, there is no space. Of course, you know, in a lesser sense, space is an entity. But and sometimes this this no thing is called space with all capitals. Okay, just as long as we understand that it's not the kind of space which exists between this and that, which is simply a perception, or as Kant would call it, a category of consciousness, a category of mind. So the boundless, immutable principle. My gosh, it doesn't change. It's immutable. And yet Heraclitus said, nothing is constant but change. Well, both are true. There's perpetual motion. It goes on forever, plus, minus, plus, minus, in, out, in, out, on, off, on, off. So that, that perpetual duality is apparently there. But, you know, just the way all planets are absorbed into the synthesizing planets and all planets are finally absorbed into one synthesizer, I do believe that all fundamentals of the secret doctrine are finally absorbed into the boundless immutable principle and that in the last analysis it's the only real principle uh, because it doesn't deal with multiplicity and the minute that you get into multiplicity you're into the realm of the Mahamaya and you know the many the many are not real, the one is real, but the many are actual, and they have to be dealt with forever. <laughs> so we're not getting rid of the many, okay? We're just having to beautify the many and work out our own creative projects, the creative project of the universe. But the boundless, immutable principle, that's what we really are. It's the first thing, and it's causeless. There was no cause of it. It's the cause of itself, but, you know, that's not really accurate to say. It just always was, always will be. And, you know, when you first start thinking about this stuff, you, you say, well, everything has a beginning and an end, doesn't it? Well, the no thing apparently has no beginning and no end. No beginning, no end. I sometimes call it, you know, we could dilate on these different names and give different perspectives on the no thing. I call it the essence. I don't know if I should call it the quintessence, because that's a limitation. 
I could call it something like the ultima, the ultima essence. Something like that. <laughs> you just can't get beyond its essentiality. It's so essential that it, it has no cause and cannot be reduced and cannot be changed. You can call it God if you want with capital letters, you know. This is not the same as the billions and billions of gods who emanated, who are emanations of the universal logos. You can't, can't do that. Uh, this god is not all those countless sun suns, as Madame Blavatsky calls them in the secret doctrine, or as the secret doctrine calls them. It's um, all of these billions upon billions upon, you know, who knows, who knows. We're not in any position to know how many there are in this apparently finite universe, bounded universe, but um, we know that all these gods are the emanation of the uh, unbounded one, or the unbounded oneness, or the unbounded suchness, you know, just a bunch of names. But if they can trigger something in our consciousness, oh, aha, aha, there's a realization, because that's what identification requires. Identification depends upon, you know, it's my little Bible here, it, it depends upon realization, esoteric experience, and absorption into the whole. Then we will have identification. I call it also the infinitessence. Well, you know, it's like the infinite essence, but I put the word together, the infinitessence, uh, blotting out all particularity, particularity, the word particularity has to do with particle or part, and blotting out all parts. In this infinitessence is the ultimate homogeneity. That's another thing we could call it, the ultimate homogeneity. I call it the one and only. That's obvious. And uh, the one without a second. I told you the story about how in the German translation of one of my books, um, it came out as the one without a second of time, you know, without a minute to lose. But uh, it means the one which has no second one to it. And even emanations from it are all part of it, of course, but they're not really uh, independent whatsoever. They all are sustained by this one which has no second, even though in the great Mahamaya it appears not only to have a second, but a third and a fourth and on, you know, to how whatever number it is in our apparently uh, finite universe. I call this thing, this no thing, reality. And I don't call it, you know, that's with all capital letters, kind of limited there, but uh, I don't call it reality with a capital R because that's reality in universe, and I certainly don't call it reality with a small r, uh, which to me is really actuality that which has come forth in illusion. That is actuality. It's not reality at all. And yet, ultimately, everything is reality, even though it doesn't s seem to be so. No, I mean, it, it, it is an illusion, but, of course, what's behind the illusion, what is the illusion, there's only one reality. I call it by a word which is also um, used to indicate matter. Uh, I call it substance, but I don't mean matter. I don't mean objectivity. I mean that which immutably substands all. All that ever will be, all that ever has been, it's the substance. And maybe if I pronounce it that way, substance, uh, it would make more sense instead of substance. Okay, But ultimately, with Spinoza in this case, I find that it is the uh, the one and only whatever out of which all things are made, out of which all things come. You know, God has only itself. So uh, what's it going to do? Reach over to something else and make a universe? You know, the whole universe is spun. Svabhavat, you know, the self-existent one, spins the 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 eternal web, the universe, out of itself. So it substands everything. And, you know, understand and substand. Substand seems more to do with the essence and understand more with the 
second ray and coming to terms, but you definitely stand under everything that you can possibly perceive. Hmm. So, you know, who are you? I am substance. Okay, lock him up, but okay. <laughs> you, are, you are substance. And if we can get beyond our image in the mirror, and beyond the way we feel, and beyond what we think, and beyond so many limited states, we will begin to substand. I have another mantra. Well, I'll give you lots of mantras as we go along. You know, some may be useful to you. I gave you one this... Tiom, uh, Tiom, this too is of me, Tiom. But when thinking about the, and of course you can do these on different notes, and uh, you know I'll try to suggest what notes to work with, because in the old days, DK tells us in Atlantean days, the notes were really important. They carried a certain ray vibration, and they carried us towards realization. We've forgotten all that, we've lost all that, but we will regain all that if we need it. So another. Uh, Uma, Uma, O O M A, Uma, Uma. What could I mean by that? Just a very fundamental thought. Out of me, all. Out of me. No ordinary me, right? Out of me, all. And I have many combinations and permutations of that. You can get specific. All out of me, all this, out of me, all that, and so forth. And until every direction you look, there's nothing but the one nameless, all-inclusive self, Uma, the unbounded one, the ultimate, you know, whatever. Max, the max. And, and then, you know, finally, these are just a few. The unknown darkness. Well, it, it, it says, you know, that there's no consciousness in that. Just ceaseless, uh, eternal breath which knows itself not. I've never been able to accept that. You know, as I say the other time, I finally figured it out, or I, I thought I did, you know consciousness or self-objectification that's what consciousness is as far as I'm concerned is so far removed from beingness from what I want to call the infinitensivity infinitense infinitensivity of the infinite essence from that ultimate ultimate nameless state there's no need for consciousness one is so <laughs> one is just the infinite being and that in itself includes all the possibilities of self-objectification therefore I can justify to myself why to use such a term as the unknown darkness unconscious of itself because consciousness infinitesimalizes anything it touches well we're we're all after expansion of consciousness and we necessarily are but you know, when we get into being, into the disciplines of life, it, you know, D.K. tells us uh, nothing can hold the group. No, the rules of time and space cannot hold the group, rule six. It onward moves in life. What does it mean to onward move in life? Well, we probably have no idea. But it has to do with this experience of the intensification of the presence of what life is in our registration, in our consciousness, this intensification of the of what life is, and that's why I call it ultimately infinitensivity. Well, we're we're a long way from infinitensivity, except we've never left it. Uh, in the veiling, in the in the veiling uh, that has occurred in the universe, we forgot how infinitense we can be. <laughs> but. Uh, 
there, the, in the unbounded darkness, in the unknown darkness, there's no need to know, because being takes the place of knowing. And that's something to ponder, I would say. And you can wonder, well, if I, if I can't know it, how can I know it? How can I be conscious of it? Well, because I do believe there are these states of being which transcend the registration of myself, self-objectification. We'll get into that more to try to explain why, why consciousness has created the universe and has limited, almost absolutely, the limitless one. Okay, so those are some names for the nameless and some of the ideas associated with them do you have anything anything come to mind because after all we can only discuss what the mind shows perhaps um, if there's anybody who cares to uh, say anything and um, maybe Brett would you be so kind as to look at the uh, if there's any questions there because my question registering function is kaput we have one from Isabel. Yes. Say, Sir Edwin Arnold, the song celestial, mm. poetical Absolutely. translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Never the spirit yes. was born, the spirit shall cease to be never, never was time, mm. it was not. End and beginning are dreams, birthless and deathless and changeless. Mm. Mm -hmm. remaineth the spirit forever death has not touched it at all dead though the house of it seems mm. it's a wonderful book and uh, I just get chills when I hear those words um, and you know if, if you haven't uh, read um, well he has he has two translations doesn't he I mean the, one of the Bhagavad Gita, right, and the other, the light of uh, light of Asia, great long poems, and he was a early theosophist, you know, and, and into the most beautiful poetic language he manages to uh, put these perceptions, you see, and uh, he's just captured, and 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 also from this, uh, from one of these books, uh, there's a closing statement that the dewdrop slips into the shining sea. It is so... You well, know, it's exactly what we are, you know, as emanations, as, as uh, rays of the Absolute. Uh, we are in the sea of Mahamaya. Uh, it is the great ocean of life. Uh, it is shining with uh, its own self-generated light. And we appear to be the dewdrop, but we are all also the shining sea. <laughs> and eventually there comes the time that the dewdrop slips into the shining sea. And yet containing these thoughts and these perceptions and these identifications, okay, we have to still have knowledge of the parts and pieces and combinations and presentations we have to have the knowledge of the Mahamaya as well as the dissolving of the Maya, Mahamaya into this uh, endless spirit this endless ocean of life of course you know the secret doctrine tells us of course it is endless but it's uh, cyclically appearing <laughs> and uh, you know not not all of the poems get in, into the metaphysics of it it's a sort of universal application of the law of periodicity so read the light of Asia read the uh, Sir Edwin Arnold's uh, translation of the Bhagavad Gita just fantastic material it just goes straight to your heart it's just uh, it, well, you know it's the story of the Buddha you know he he, he it's a poem of a hundred pages I don't know longer 
it's the whole story of the Buddha and his realizations and uh, all put into very fine English poetry. It's been a long time, but it's certainly, uh, I haven't been there for a long time, but I remember how thrilled I was when uh, when I first encountered that. So thank you, thank you for suggesting that. I see Elena, Elena, you have your hand raised, so uh, go ahead, Elena, go ahead. Uh, well, in my semi-conscious state here, <laughs> little, I, little early I, uh, there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have to go, you know, with all this really, uh, how would I say, infinity uh, cannot comprehend finiteness. So it is said. Like uh, the boundless can have no relation uh, to the boundage. Uh, so, um, in the occult teaching, uh, the the unknown, the unknown, or the self-existing is the absolute divine essence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so uh, being absolute consciousness, uh, you know, to our very limited senses, mm. uh, uh, is uh, uh, something to describe undescribable. Mm. Um, that, uh, as you said, uh, consciousness implies limitations and qualifications, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But when we're talking about absolute consciousness, uh, which it contains the cognize, the thing co uh, cognized, the things cognized, and the cognition. So mm -hmm. we, we're mm -hmm. dealing all, all, with all three in itself, all three in one. The and how. Is Yes, yes. yes. So, mm. you know, again, uh, with, with our perception, we can be conscious maybe of no, no more than one portion of, you know, of something. Um, mm. Uh, mm. And um, uh, maybe mm. that's why, you know, when we try to think... Uh, or, or put a name to absolute consciousness, it, it's like be, it's unconsciousness, because um, just, to us. just, yes, to us, just as we can call the absolute, as you say, darkness, because to our finite understanding, it appears, mm. you know, as a darkness quite impenetrable. Uh, mm, so, mm, uh, mm. Uh, is is you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's you know sometimes uh, to describe something uh, with a finite mind, it's it, it's incomprehensible or um, we we uh, we have to have a different language somehow. Um, Mm. To, to, to these ideas. But you know, mm. when I was thinking mm. uh, how we, where we are, generally mm. speaking, a disciples mm. on the path, mm. uh, just start when we're talking about identity, for example. Uh, mm. You know, I was a little pondering, you know, before this me uh, webinar about uh, 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 something which is the first, what I, uh, what I call the first step uh, towards uh, the infinite, uh, absolute essence or identity, if you can call it identity, on that level. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, are we able, it's a very, a very first step, to answer this question for ourselves, are we able to identify with other persons a level of consciousness or being or his identity and be in that identity in completeness mm. Uh, mm. in order to 
to reach that first level of the absolute essence of that what the other person is if we try to really be in the sameness of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. identity. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very good point. And of course, this is what the the Christ has uh, as uniquely or to the greatest extent in our present uh, humanity. That that ability to to slip into the it's a form of yoga, really. It's a uh, it, it's I would almost call it the yoga of identification to to slip into the beingness of the other and realize the sameness of it. Uh, and you know it has it has to be as far as I'm concerned, practiced. You know, the feeling of unity, the feeling of being together, being part of each other and all that, it kind of comes first and then one slips into the sameness of the object. Now, in other words, when we think of other people, they become objectified. What has to happen is they have to become, if I can use the word, subjectified. And we have to realize no difference uh, in the beingness that we call our own and the beingness that we have discovered in the other, they are identical. And and so, you know, it's so subtle. Uh, sometimes uh, <clears throat> there is this statement in occultism about the blinking of the dragon's eye. I often refer to it. It means that for a, a split second, the dragon blinks his eye and reality is seen. Identicality, sameness is seen, and then it fades. And so eventually the dragons of wisdom, which we are to become, have to open their eyes completely. And it's no longer a blinking, it's a steady perception of the sameness of all objects. They are as if occurring within your own identity. Now, look, we're all going to evolve our own language here. You're going to do it your way, I'm going to do it my way, you know, our, our little relative eyes. We're going to find the languaging that triggers for us the realization. Or we'll find the method. Maybe we'll use no language at all. Maybe we'll just find a way in to the utter homogeneity which it represents. So I appreciate you bringing up these ideas and a very first step learn how to identify with others that's that's step one learn how to identify as others as others and that's a really big step and that's all in the unity and that's all in the love and that's all in what Christ is trying to bring to humanity these steps to enter the true identity of all things, and not just people, of course, but anything, anything whatsoever. You know, I joked with my son, even the asphalt, even the asphalt. You know, we're walking along the black asphalt. Even the asphalt, Dad? Yeah, I said, yeah, even the asphalt. He's a philosopher, and, you know, whatever comes to consciousness, whatever presentation is there, even that. But, of course, I would begin with people, and, uh, you know, you can go on to the animal kingdom or the plants or the minerals or whatever, or the higher beings, but there's no content of consciousness which escapes the reality of sameness while maintaining its apparent diversity. So, you know, we study all these things from decay and theosophy and all the rest, and we must study and study and study and learn everything about the expanding worlds, the various rings pass not through which we will enter. Everything, everything, all will be known. They say in Shambhala all is known. Well, that's as far as our planet is concerned. We will know everything about what we have become as a universe. No way to float off mystically and say, I don't need to know. No, you need to know everything. But at the same time, sustaining the absolute homogeneity of identicality of being and it must be practiced even five minutes a day in our relative world even five minutes a day saying this too is of me all this of me and understanding what me is nothing personal nothing ego that the egg is broken it's not about eggs you know ego e eggs 
the universal egg, the non-eternal egg, the eternal egg. It's not about eggs. <laughs> it, that breaks. This too is of me. Out of me, all. Just those little mantras, if you can work with them, they will be very useful. I appreciate Elena. I know what semi-consciousness is at the early hour of the morning, but it is closer to real consciousness. As to what absolute consciousness is, that's a, a metaphysical question. And I do, there's something in the secret doctrine that says, Father, for Father, Mother, and Son were once more one. And the Son had not awakened yet for the new wheel and his pilgrimage thereon. So this is all taking place when the great wheel is Anupadaka, the great wheel is absorbed in the one and only. And uh, the differentiations of subject, object, and the relation between are not existing temporarily, even though time is not. Okay, Leia, hold on, I'm getting, I, I, I saw you there, and just go ahead. Yes, Leah. Thank you. A tiny example um, of the homogeneity in practice, an esotericist that, whom we probably all know was in Bali and he talks about how a ta he was in a taxi and the taxi driver um, was a lovely Hindu Balinese another taxi came along very very erratically and forced them off the road the esotericist mm -hmm. said why didn't you toot your horn at him and the taxi driver said why would I do that to myself <laughs> yeah no, there's someone who's really carrying it with him carrying the that kind of realization of course you know um, there's a difference between theorizing about it, right, you know, and saying, okay, well, every once in a while we sit down and think about those things and actually carrying these, that type of self-perception with us all the time. Very interesting, of course. You know, uh, in the world of relativity, there are friends, there are enemies, there are division of forces, there are pluses and minuses. The, it says that the rays hate and kill each other until a certain point when they re-become one, you know, when they at the top of the mountain. So there's going to be diversity, there's going to be that apparent um, friction at the lower levels of understanding and consciousness. But all of that will resolve uh, on the mountain of initiation and uh, the thrill of discovering that those he fought were but brothers and himself. <laughs> so we're in that process. We've risen a fair way along the ladder of evolution and we begin to see the harmony instead of the apparent difference of things. Why would I do that to myself? Okay, we can ponder on that. Thank you, Leah, for that. Thank you. Okay. Well, these, the, you know, these are deep matters, so deep that it can almost make us zone out, you know, we can almost say, oh my God, can't think of a thing here, you know, because we're just so caught up in what? The intensity of being, you know. There was a movie called The Unbearable Lightness of Being, I'm not sure, the, the title was great, it maybe was about different things, but... Um, there are such intensities of being, and really, we don't have to just deal with being. There are such intensities of knowledge and of love that you, the form just can't stand it. The form would just shatter, incinerate, break apart, dissolve, whatever. There are these intensities of realization that, that only the gods can realize. And yet, it, it, it's something that Eleanor said, I want to say that... I'll say another radical thing here. Occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll say what I think are some radical things. Um, I would say that the universal logos, the one and only God of any universe, is infinitely distant from the beingness 
of the Absolute and will only know of the infinite distance from its infinitesimal state to the absolute infinitude of the Absolute when the Mahapralaya comes. This is all getting into a little bit about mathematics and I'll try to explain my perceptions about this. How to reduce all beings to one being and all beings become simply a point which is but is next to nothing which is but is next to no thing which is the absolute infinitesimal juxtaposed in illusion of course to the absolute infinitude so even the universal logos you know <laughs> It's a bounded being. It's a specialized ray of the absoluteness. And how that all arose, maybe we'll get into that next time, at least a theory of the arising of something out of nothing. Well, um, I just want to... Well, we're getting... We're getting... Oh, we're there. We're there. I, I just, in, in time and space, I don't want to carry these things on too long. One could go on and on and on, you know. Um, I have more to say, and we will all have more to think about when it comes to uh, isolated unity, the way the logoic plane is involved, and the atma, the first... Uh, differentiation as spiritual will of the monadic being and how the different aspects of the egoic lotus are all involved um, we'll, we'll study DK's words on those things um, right here I have this all set for tonight but uh, things happen or they don't happen um, and uh, I'll just mention this so I can say I've done it. But the result of meditation on the theme of isolated unity is a definite illumination of the mind, for it will then be at one with the universal mind, and all the ways of God and the plans of God will stand revealed. And we're going to get into this next time. I, I almost promise it, okay? And then what else will happen? The creative imagination. Now that that's a second ray. That's a second ray effect of meditating on the first ray theme of isolated unity. Then the creative imagination will be powerfully evoked in response to this revelation. And modes and methods, you know, third ray, of cooperation will be sentiently developed. You'll feel them. You'll have sensitivity to them. And the disciple will become a creative cooperator and not just an obedient servant of the plan. Well, sometimes it might be enough for us to be obedient servants of the plan, but more is held before us as possibility. And meditating upon isolated unity, isolating the unity, our creative imagination will come into effect and we will start becoming the plan in this relative world of our planetary existence. This is our job, you know. Being is one thing, doing is another. Dooby dooby doo. Okay, we have to do both. Finally, his life will then be inspired. Now, that's the first ray effect. His life will then be inspired by the desire to serve humanity and to cooperate with the custodians of the plan. This will bring in the full tide of soul life, which none of us have, producing temporarily a violent conflict between the personality ray and the soul ray, but also producing a steady subordination of the lower to the higher, of the minor to the major. So we will discuss those things next time and he will tell us really how advanced this subject is that is not just uh, intuitive illumination this is more like let there be light it's the bounded uh, the the, the un unfettered almost boundless light if it's unfettered uh, of shambhala i see the greatest light and we're all trying to shed light now on the unity and the identicality which must be isolated 
Okay, friends, um, we'll, we'll get into that. I, I almost promise if you don't lead me astray or if I don't lead myself astray, <laughs> it, will, uh, it will happen. Uh, so let's close our work tonight with uh, just uh, something practical. Uh, just our little mantra of the new group of world servers. Because no matter how universal or trans universal we may find ourselves to be, at least theoretically, we have an immediate obligation here and now, always here and now, the service of the immediately present. And just to remind you again, our Virgo um, exact moment full moon meditation broadcast will be starting at 5 o'clock uh, GMT, Universal Time. And the actual moment of the full moon uh, today, the 29th of August, is 6.35 and 9 seconds p.m. It depends on what ephemeris you use, but I'm using the Swiss ephemeris, which is in solar fire, and the Swiss are pretty accurate people. So there are differentiations on these ephemerides, but we're pretty close within a minute, you know, half a minute, something like that. Okay, friends, let's just do this wherever we may be. <coughs> Oh, yes. And let's just, un unless some real problem arises, we'll meet on the same time, same station, Saturday morning, GMT, September 5th. Let's see. I believe it's correct. The 5th. Yep, yeah. September 5th. <clears throat> I'll send this out to you, and we'll make sure that all of you who attend the webinars are on the uh, constant contact list of the Moria Federation, so you'll be sure to receive these uh, notifications. May the power of the one life pour through the group of all true servers. May the love of the one soul characterize the lives of all who seek to aid the great ones. May we fulfill our part in the one work through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness, and right speech. Oh. I always think that self-remembrance is as, as important as self-forgetfulness. The two go together, you know. Forget the self that is unreal. Remember the self that is the reality itself. Okay, friends, we'll, uh, Brett and I, I will get this out to you as soon as we can and uh, out to others who can only uh, participate through the video. Appreciate your attendance and um, have a great day as you move towards the uh, full moon, you know, it's coming up and uh, even though Virgo seems such a sign of uh, practical things, it's, it's your monad, it's your monad, so uh, I'm just uh, unmuting you here so we can create that great cacophony of goodbyes and uh, which uh, I always like, actually. <laughs> so someone can help me unmute these these folks and and uh, all. <laughs>
There we are. There we are in all of our un unmuted, uh, unmuted splendor. You know. Uh, okay. I, I don't bye, mean bye. to be many of you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Just a consciousness of observation and movement. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Okay. Thank you.